Again, I am so glad that you are here to start out our lecture series. We have a fascinating speaker tonight. Um, we've spoken on the phone more than, uh, than we've spent time face to face. Jenna Frage uh, began her work in, uh, with ACCESS, a cultural arts program back in 1999 as an educational outreach coordinator. I think we have similar roots, always being in education. And during her time there, she helped develop and implement SURA, an acronym which uh, represented a youth photography program, uh, which later won a prestigious Coming Up Taller Award in 2008. Uh, she's cu currently the Curator of Education at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn. If you have never been there before, please put it on your list. It's a wonderful destination, and I know she brought materials from the museum, which are in the back tonight. You owe it to yourself the next time you're down that way to visit that really beautiful facility. I've gone there a number of times uh, to cultural alliance meetings. It's a, it's a magnificent place. Her duties uh, there include organizing and implementing their nationwide educational activities, including cultural competency, competency workshops for students and professionals. She's published an article about cultural competency efforts post 9-11 in the Journal of Museum Education. And um, that <coughs> issue is entitled Beyond Teachers. She's an advocate of using varying social media tools. You and I need to talk about that. In many of the museum's youth programs as a means to share art, ideas, and information with those around the globe. For us tonight, what's really important is she is the child of immigrants from Lebanon. Palestine, and has a fascinating, fascinating story to tell us. So would you please warmly welcome Janet Fraze. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good to hear. I'm really excited to be here. I don't really come out this way very often. I live in Ann Arbor, and I work in Dearborn, and I... My family's all in Canton, so I'm always on that side. <laughs> I'm never over here, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my parents' immigration stories. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, what it was like for me growing up as an Arab American. So at the end of my presentation, I will allow time for questions and answers. And please feel free to ask anything on your mind. If for whatever reason you're shy or embarrassed to ask me in front of everybody, you can definitely ask me. Um, afterwards, okay? So I'm going to identify what it means to be an Arab American before I get into the stories here. But actually, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to ask you to tell me what countries are Arab countries? There are 22 Arab countries. Who can name some Arab countries for me? Egypt. Okay. Syria. Syria. Yep, the United Arab Emirates. Good. Kuwait. Kuwait. Okay. Lebanon. Jordan, Lebanon. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Iraq, yep. Yeah. Um, Jordan. Jordan. Okay. Any others? Tunisia. Tunisia, good. I was just going to say we're missing a whole chunk. The north, a lot of the North African Arab countries. We named Egypt. So here is the map. I apologize that the countries are so small. But a lot of people are surprised to find out that 10 of the Arab countries are in Africa. And then there are 12 in Asia. So there are 22 altogether. And there are three things that make an Arab country an Arab country. Uh, one is that they belong to something called the League of Arab States. So it's sort of like a club. If you belong to the club, you're an Arab country. Um, there's a shared culture and history and tradition uh, amongst the people that live in these countries. And then Arabic is the official language. So the only country that's an exception to that is Somalia. Somali is the official language of Somali. So that's, this is the Arab world right here. And so an Arab American is somebody who comes from uh, one of those 22 countries. So my family, my parents, come from a town called Ramallah, which is in the West Bank of Palestine. So here is a map of Israel and the Palestinian territories. So the West Bank is right over here. And Ramallah is where my family comes from. Now, historically, 
Ramallah was a Christian town, so my family is all Christian. When I tell people that I'm an Arab Christian, guess what reaction I get? <laughs> I get a lot of surprise, surprise reactions, uh, jaws have dropped, etc. And sometimes, even after I explain that I'm an Arab Christian, people will still ask me why I don't wear the scarf or if I've ever gone to Mecca and things like that. It's a very hard concept for people to understand. But in fact, in the Arab world, there are 14 million Christians. And uh, many people have asked the question, oh, so did your family convert to Christianity recently, or how did that work? Newsflash, Palestinian Christians were amongst the first Christians. So um, if you think about it, you know, yeah. So anyway, so it's, it's pretty exciting to think that I have that, that heritage. So at the time my family was living there, like I said, it was uh, predominantly Christian. That's not the case anymore. Now it's predominantly Muslim. And also when my family was living in Ramallah, it was very, it was a small village and now it's a big city and it's a, it's a tourist attraction in that area as well. So I thought I would start off by talking about my father's story. So my mom and my dad actually met in Michigan, even though they're both from the same town. So I thought I would talk about my father first. This is my dad when he was, I want to say, 18 years old. And he immigrated to San Diego, California in 1961. So the story goes that he was, uh, he wanted to go to the United States to pursue an education. And he had an older brother who was already living in San Diego. So he thought, well, I'll just go live with my brother and go to school in San Diego. So that's what he did. He tells some funny stories. So when he uh, moved to San Diego, um, he met his brother's wife for the first time. My uh, uncle had met and married a woman from Tennessee who had a very deep southern twang. So my dad learned British English when he was in Palestine. So hearing somebody with a southern accent, it was very difficult for him to understand her. So they had some you know, cultural clashes sometimes. But anyway, after a year of uh, going to San Diego, or sorry, two years of going to San Diego State, my, um, my dad's brother and his wife decided they wanted to move to Tennessee to be closer to her family. So my dad went along for the ride. He went to University of Tennessee, early 60s. Imagine what it was like for an immigrant um, to live in the South at that time. It was very difficult for him, and he says that he remembers going to the cafeteria every day and all of the dark or ethnic students sat on one table and everybody else sat in the rest of the cafeteria and there was definitely some contention there. And after he graduated, he got out of Tennessee <laughs> and he, his family actually had immigrated to Michigan um, right around the time he was graduating. So he moved to Michigan. Now, why Michigan? Does anybody know what initially attracted a lot of um, people, a lot of Arabs to auto. this area. Right, the auto industry. So a lot of Arabs, you know, it just makes sense, chain migration, right? So you want to go somewhere where there's already an, an Arab population uh, established. So even though that was the initial thing that attracted people, it wasn't the only thing. So again, it just, once that Arab community sort of, you know, was established, then more and more Arabs were coming. So for my dad's family, one reason why they chose to come to Michigan was because there was already a significant Palestinian Christian community that was established here. So that's why they came. So my dad moved to be closer to his family. My mom's story, this is my, oops, this is my mom right here. And she is one of seven girls, no boys. And her story um, is, is pretty interesting. She was uh, 16 years old, and her oldest sister, the tall one in the middle, um, got married and moved to Kuwait. And when my mom was 16, her parents decided to go to Michigan to uh, work and to raise money, and then they were going to come back and bring that money with them to Palestine so that they could have a better life in Palestine. And they brought the, their youngest daughter with them. Their youngest daughter was very young at the time. So what happened, though, was that while my grandparents and their youngest child were in Michigan, a war broke out. 
So there was the Six Day War in 1967 that broke out. And so instead of going back, my parents, or I'm sorry, my grandparents um, basically sent a message to my mom and said that she had to not only come to the United States, but she had to bring four of her younger sisters with her. So by herself, didn't speak any English, had never left Ramallah, didn't know anything about American culture. And to make it even worse, to make it even harder, I should say, they moved to the inner city of Detroit, where my mom and her family didn't know anything about you know, African-American culture. And the African-Americans at that time didn't really know much about Arab culture. So it was a very, very uh, difficult time for my mom and for her family. Well. Then, <laughs> shortly after my, I love this picture, by the way. I think it's so cute. <laughs> That's my mom's mom. And that kind of sums up her personality right there. So my, um, so I kind of want to explain how they met. So people ask all the time, was their marriage arranged? And the answer to that is yes and no. So no in the sense that they weren't told from the time they were born that they had to marry each other or anything like that. But in Arab culture, family is very important. And you rely on your family for a lot of things, including finding a spouse for you sometimes. So also, um, the, the, a lot of the Arab communities are very tight-knit, and they know one another. And so you trust your parents' um, opinions. They know a lot of the com community members maybe better than you would, so, they, you know, so you trust their judgment. So my dad's parents said to my father, Faraj, there's this family that has seven daughters, and they just came here from Palestine. Their oldest daughter is married, but there's six more. Um, obviously, some of them were too young. <laughs> so why don't we go over there and just, you know, check, out, check it out and see what happens. So my dad was, was excited, and he went. And it's funny because they actually wanted him to uh, get to know my mom's younger sister, who, by the way, was only 14 at the time. My mom was 16. And um, when he, th this is the story, my mom served him coffee. That's a big part of Arab culture, too. You always serve coffee to your guests. And so my dad, or my mom, served my dad coffee. And he said right then and there he knew that she was the one that he wanted to marry. And so my mom, um, and my dad got to know each other that night, and they got engaged, I think, a week later. Which, which one thing I want to explain, traditionally, and things are changing, but traditionally the way it went was that your engagement period was your courtship period. So that was when you got to know each other. That's when you dated, essentially. And then if you wanted to break off that engagement, you could. And in fact, my mom was engaged three times before she <laughs> married my dad. So I used to ask my mom, so what was it about dad? I mean, you turned down these other men. What was it about dad? Was he handsome? Or She said, no, he was skinny and had a big nose. It had nothing to do with him being handsome. <laughs> so... When I asked her what it was, she said, I don't know. There was just something about him, he, the way he treated me and his mannerisms, and he was very respectful. And they were happily married for 42 years. until My dad passed away a year and a half ago. But for 42 years, I mean, think about that. Sometimes I wonder, hmm, maybe that's the route I should go, <laughs> just an arranged marriage. Because honestly, in our society, that's something that's unheard of and, and sort of shocking when you think about it. But it works for some people, right? So... So this, again, this is a picture of my parents at their wedding. And I'm skipping a lot of historical, you know, dates and, and events and things like that, but my mom and dad had four children. The one in the pink dress is me. And my, it's funny, I have very curly hair, naturally, and my mom did not know how to handle curly hair. So, hence the boy cut. My, pretty much my whole childhood, I had that haircut. So, the, I wanted to talk about the names really quick. So my sister, this is my oldest sister, Sandy. So it goes girl boy, girl boy. Sandy, and then Salim, and then me, and my brother George. So the name Salim is a significant name in my family. So the way it works in Arab culture is that the first son is named after the grandfather, the paternal grandfather. So my brother was named after my dad's dad. George, uh, may not seem like it, but it's actually a very common uh, Arab Christian name. So in my family, my grandfather was George, 
My brother's George. I think I have four cousins named George. My nephew's George. So it's a very common <laughs> name in my family. And then there's Sandy and Janice. Where did those name, <laughs> names come from? So we, when I was a, a teenager, I remember asking my parents, where, you know, because my sister's name, by the way, is Sandra Jean. So imagine a little Palestinian kid named Sandra Jean. Just didn't really fit. But anyway, my dad enlightened us and told us that my sister and I were actually named after some of his first American girlfriends when he came to the U.S. <laughs> so when I, you know, when I asked my mom how she felt about that, she said, I didn't care. He's mine now, you know. So, so for her... Um, it, it, didn't, it wasn't an issue for her. But anyway, so all four of us were born and raised in the Metro Detroit area. I was six years old when we moved to Canton. Um, I, my first six years were spent in Westland. And it was hard. It was hard growing up in a predominantly white suburb for many reasons. Uh, first of all, we stood out. I mean, it was, we were a lot darker than most of the people. Um, in, in our neighborhood and in school. So I went to Plymouth Canton schools and in high school, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the campus of the high schools there, but at the time that I graduated, there were two high schools on one campus and you actually had uh, classes in, at both schools. And altogether, there were 4,000 people that attended those schools. And there were maybe 20 or 30 Arabs in that entire, yeah. So we, so we definitely stood out. Also, um, we got teased for not just being darker, but um, you know, when I brought friends over, they would make comments about my parents having accents, uh, or also the smell, the smell, you know, the different spices and herbs my mom would use would, uh, I thought, made our house smell good, but um, some of my friends didn't really think that was the case. So. In addition, you know, hummus and pita bread are very common and popular and trendy now, but they weren't in the 80s when I was growing up. And so I would get teased for bringing this weird, mushy stuff, this hummus. You know, what is that? Um, and, yeah, so it was hard. And then when I was in ninth grade is when the first Gulf War came. Um, and that was really hard as well because all of a sudden we were viewed as the enemy kind of. And so that was, that was hard. And, and that was really, I mean, even though I had been teased before that, that was the first time when I really felt like, wow, these people are really viewing me as an other. I'm a different person. And it was, yeah, it was really, it was really difficult. Um, I had, oh, also, I just wanted to say, my brothers had it a lot worse than my sister and I did, though. Being an Arab man, there are a lot of negative stereotypes associated with Arab men. So they would get teased and they were called terrorists and all sorts of things. Um, so it was, it was really difficult, a little bit more so I think for them than for my sister and I. So some defining moments. When I was in ninth grade, I was in a cultural geography class. And I remember this was right around the time of the first Gulf War. And my teacher asked the class to talk about, um, to talk about what stereotypes they had about Arabs. And they were supposed to write them down, but they didn't. And they were saying them out loud. So here I am, the only Arab in my class, and everybody is just saying the worst things I've ever heard um, about my culture, about my people. And it was, it was really hard for me to sit there and hear that. So they were saying, um, again, you know, they're all terrorists, and they're, they all beat up their wives, and all the women are ignorant and oppressed, and... And, you know, the list goes on and on. And, and so I'm sitting there, I'm looking around, and I thought, what is happening here? Do they not realize that I'm an Arab? Or do they not care? Or do they just think, oh, well, she's different? Or, you know, I, I just didn't understand what they were thinking. So I could only handle about 10 or 15 minutes of that until I left, and I went to the girls' bathroom, and I cried the rest of the period. I couldn't sit there and take that. So... One of my classmates came into the bathroom and said, well, the teacher would like to speak to you. So at the end of class, I went and I spoke to him, and I, and I, was, I told him I was really upset. And I, I said, well, he could see that I had tears all over my face. But he said, well, Janice, you're missing the whole point. 
you didn't stay for the entire time. The reason I had them talk about the stereotypes is because, you know, I wanted to let them know that we're going to spend a few days um, sort of defying those stereotypes and, and spreading the truth. And I still, and I understood his point, but I just thought that it was pretty ridiculous that he didn't stop the students when they were, you know, saying some pretty mean things. Either way, that, that experience really changed me because I realized that there are a lot of ignorant people out there and a lot of people that are, you know, nice people that just have some um, skewed perceptions of reality. And so instead of getting upset and crying, I decided that I needed to do something about it. So at that point, I decided that I would start learning more about my heritage. To back up, prior to that, I didn't like being an Arab. I was ashamed of it. I didn't like being different than everybody else. So when people would ask me what I was, I would just say, I'm an Arab, and then I would just change the subject really quick. I didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't want to learn about my own heritage. And so after that, however, I started asking my parents more questions about, about my heritage and about you know, being Palestinian specifically. And then I started expressing more interest in their own, uh, you know, their stories. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a defining moment for me. And, uh, oh yeah, one more thing that I wanna, wanted to mention about that. Another reason why I didn't like being Arab before that is because my parents were pretty strict. And so I s associated their strictness with my heritage. And no teenager wants to be told that she can't date and that she can't sleep over her friend's house and, you know, things like that. And so those were things that, those were rules that we had, and I didn't like that because it made me different. People would tease me like, gosh, you're, you can't do anything, you know. I had a 10 o'clock curfew when I was a senior in high school, which was unheard of. And so, so again, I tried to, you know, not let those things bother me so much, and I decided that I wanted to learn more about my heritage. So that led me to my job at ACCESS, the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services, when I was 20, 20 years old. And I was hired to teach people about Arab culture. And guess what I realized at that time? I didn't know anything. I knew about being a Palestinian Christian, but I didn't know anything about Islam. I didn't know anything about Muslims. I didn't know anything about people from the North African Arab countries. So I had to learn in order to teach. So that was when I, most of my learning came from other people. Yes, I read books. Yes, I took classes. I majored in Middle Eastern studies and Arabic. But honestly, the, I learned the most from talking to people. And also, um, I lived in Egypt for eight months. I did a study abroad in Egypt for four months, and I liked it so much that I went back, and I lived there for another four months. And I feel like I learned more about Arab culture and guess what? I experienced culture shock when I went there. Even though I grew up Arab, um, living in an Arab country is very different. No concept of lines in a lot of Arab countries, which was very hard for me to deal with. But, um, but again, I mean, you, you realize, okay, this isn't necessarily wrong. It's just different than what I'm used to. But it, that was eye-opening for me because I realized that I was also being judgmental towards people that were doing things differently than, you know, than I did. So anyway, again, skipping a lot of details, uh, I lived in New Zealand. I served a mission for my church. Oh, by the way, I'm Mormon. I'm probably the only Arab Mormon you will ever meet. <laughs> so, um, I, so I served, served a mission for my church um, in New Zealand. And then when I got back, I decided that I, would, I just needed to go to school full time and, and finish my degree. Up until that point, I was going to school part time and working full time. So I went to Brigham Young University, which, by the way, has the best Arabic program in the United States. That surprises people. So when I told people that I was leaving Michigan and going to Utah to study Arabic, I got a lot of funny reactions from people. But they really do have the best Arabic program. So anyway, um, after I graduated, I stayed in Utah for a few years. And then I got a job offer at the Arab American National Museum. I was very excited about the offer, but I was not excited about moving back to Michigan because I told myself I would never do that. I didn't want to stay in Utah either. I wanted to go out east. My best friend was moving to New York. That's what I wanted to do. But I decided that I, I would take the job, and I'm glad I did. I'm really glad I did. I love working at the museum. I'm very passionate about educating the public about Arab culture. Anytime, even if I have one person come up to me at the end of the presentation and tell me, 
you know, I just, I really learned a lot. Thank you so much for shedding some, some light on this topic. That makes it all worth it for me. So I just, I really feel like the work that we do at the museum is important, especially during a time when there's so much ignorance being spread about Arab culture, um, and specifically about Muslim Americans. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the museum, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So the museum was established in 2005, and so we will be celebrating our seventh anniversary in May, which I can't believe it's been seven years. So I've been there for four of the seven years. And uh, the museum was built basically, uh, well, let me explain. So before 9-11, there, uh, there was definitely discussion about building a museum. But then after 9-11, the leaders of Access, the Arab Community Center, thought, okay, we really need to do this. Because there are so, you know, there was a lot of backlash uh, against the Arab and Muslim community after 9-11. And so the museum was built. Um, this building, by the way, used to be a, a uh, what's the word, run-down furniture warehouse. And it was, so I, I remember seeing it when the building was first purchased, and I thought, how in the world is this ever going to be a museum? And now, for those of you who have been here, you can probably attest to the fact that it is a gorgeous building. It's very beautiful on the outside and on the inside. But anyway, it is the first and only institution dedicated to telling the Arab American story, which is really significant, again, like I said, because there are a lot of people that are telling our story for us, and it's usually negative. So in the museum, it focuses on, there's three main exhibits. There's one exhibit that focuses on, on immigration, so why Arabs came, when they came. By the way, any idea as to when and why the first Arabs came to the US? Any guesses? Probably church. Okay. A lot of Arab, yep, a lot of Arab Christians did come in the late 1800s um, because Christian missionaries in the U.S. were going and essentially, you know, recruiting them. But even before that. No? Okay. How many Arab countries did I say were in Africa? You remember? Ten. Ten. Okay. Why were Africans coming over? hundreds of years ago, right, as slaves. So the first Arabs actually came over as slaves um, in the 1500s. That's something that a lot of people don't realize, right? So, but then the first Arabs that came over voluntarily came over in the 1800s. And that was when we saw our first wave of Arab immigration. So at the museum, uh, we have many different programs. We have the education department, which is the department that I run. And that department um, is basically in charge of educating the public so about Arab culture. So we do lectures, workshops. We do cultural competency trainings for business professionals, lawyers, teachers, anybody who deals with Arabs on a daily basis and they don't really know how to be culturally sensitive, they come to us for these trainings. We also have youth programs. We, have, uh, we also have a public programming department, and that department is in charge of different events. So we have a film screening at the museum tomorrow. It's free. It's called, the movie is called Garbage Dreams, and it's an Egyptian film. It's very good. So if any of you are in the Dearborn area tomorrow night, it's at 6.30. And we also do, we have a film festival. We have concerts. The one thing that I want to mention about our concert series is that it's, it's uh, multicultural. It's called Global Thursdays, and they're usually, the events are usually held on Thursdays. And one thing that my, the director of the museum always says that I love is she says, we want to make sure that people understand that even though we're an ethnic museum, we're not an ethnocentric museum. So we, diff, we build a lot of bridges with other communities. So we will, for example, during the Global Thursdays concert series, we'll host African drummers, we'll host Bulgarian wedding singers, Palestinian hip hop artists. I mean, it just, it's very, very diverse. Just to show that, again, we're trying to build bridges with other communities. The museum is, um, is also, it's a pretty impressive museum for being so young. In its second year, it became an, a Smithsonian affiliate, which is pretty rare. Um, and it's one of the only museums in Michigan that is a Smithsonian affiliate. So, which means we have access to all the Smithsonian, um, not all of their collections, but to some of their collections. And we do a lot of programs with them. So it's, it's pretty exciting. So that is the museum, and that's my 
Arab American story. So now I will open up the time for uh, any questions that you may have. Yes? Oh, we have a really nice gift shop. <laughs> and it is, in fact, so many of us travel to the Arab world um, usually at least once or twice a year. Some of our staff members will go to the Arab world for you know, different exhibits or events or things like that. And we will bring back uh, a lot of really unique items. So for example, one of my colleagues uh, is from Jordan and she went to Jordan for a month over uh, in December to, you know, for the holidays and brought back a lot, of, a lot of amazing goods. So we have pottery, Jerusalem pottery, pottery. we have um, pottery from North Africa. We have a little bit of everything. So you can also shop online. If you go to our museum website, we have a, an online store. Any other questions at all about Arab culture, about my parents, my family story, the museum? Uh -huh. the, the 22 countries have always seemed to me to be very diverse culturally. Uh -huh. Is it the language that is the kind of thread, or is there more than just the language? Yeah, so the language is definitely one of the common threads, and then culture, and then the, the fact that they belong to the League of Arab States. But whenever I talk about culture being a common thread, I always have to give a little disclaimer. So if you think about the US, you think about somebody raised in Manhattan versus somebody raised on a farm in Iowa. So they're both American, right? But would you say that they practice American culture the same way? No, definitely not. So it's the same thing in the Arab world. I mean, you have these really like small, conservative, remote villages in Yemen, for example. And then you have a place like Beirut, Lebanon, which is a big metropolitan, you know, liberal town. And so, um, so you know, so there is a lot of diversity as well. And your environment, what, regardless of whether you live in the Arab world or the United States or anywhere, um, your environment is going to help shape your, your, you know, the way you perceive your own culture. Uh huh. Yeah, so there is, it's been, it's interesting because um, that's something that I've talked to my parents about because like I said, when my family was living there, uh, Ramallah was predominantly Christian. And when I say predominantly, I mean like 100%. <laughs> it was all Christian and all of the surrounding towns and villages were Muslim. And so I asked my parents about that and they said there, was, there weren't any problems at all. It was completely fine. So... And I mean, my, my dad's, my mom and dad's classmates were all Muslim and the, it, the interaction, it was just, yeah, there weren't very many problems. But over the years, um, and I'm not saying that historically there were never problems between Muslims and Christians because obviously there were um, crusades, but, but anyway, but um, it seems like the deeper and deeper um, the political problems get in the Arab world, the more and more animosity there are between the Muslims and the Christians. And what's really sad is for anybody who has really studied Islam, there is immense respect for Christians and for Jews in the Quran. So if you read the Quran, which is a holy book, it talks about respecting the people of the book. Who are people of the book? The people that belong to the other main monotheistic uh, religions. So Christians and Jews are supposed to be, you know, treated um, again with respect. And and so and also the Quran does even say that you know Muslim men can marry women that are, are of the book. So there's supposed to be again this respect, but politics have gotten in the way. Um, just, you know, culture has gotten in the way. There's so many things that get in the way of religion, in all religions, right? So not just in Islam. So that's something that has become increasingly difficult, and that's why today um, there are less, way less Christians in the Arab world than there used to be because of some of these problems. But one thing that I need to make sure you understand is that when I was living in Egypt, there is a very significant Christian population, and have they had some clashes with the Muslim population there? Yes, definitely. But for the most part, they live side by side, they work together, go to school together, and there aren't that many 
you know, that many issues. So it's not that every Muslim hates every Christian or anything like that. I mean, as a Christian Arab living in Egypt, I was very well received. There was one time where I got an argument with a guy on a bus um, about religion, but other than that, and by the way, my Arabic was very bad at the time because I was just, you know, I, I had just moved to the country and I was still kind of shaky. But what was really amazing about that is that he started attacking Christianity and everybody on the bus just sort of started defending me and started defending Christianity and most of them were Muslim. So you don't hear about stories like that, right? You just hear about, oh, all Muslims hate Christians, they're all trying to kill them, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there are a lot of Muslims that have, like I said, have immense respect for the Christian population. Uh-huh. Okay, that's a really good question. So when I was um, I, when I was growing up, I went to St. Mary's Antiochian Orthodox Church in Livonia, and it I just didn't it wasn't I didn't like it. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I just didn't like the church for di different reasons, um, and it was we basically went more for cultural reasons. It was sort of like a family reunion every week. And it was especially good for my parents to see people that they, you know, lived by when they were in Ramallah. So for many years, I decided that religion just wasn't for me. Uh, I didn't think that any religion was, was right or, and I thought religion, a lot of religious people were corrupt and had ulterior motives. And in the meantime, my brother was on this path and this journey to finding truth, if you will. And he met some Mormon missionaries and uh, learned from them, really liked their teachings. And he became Mormon, and then he taught me. And I thought that it was crazy sounding, and I didn't like anything about it at first. But then the more and more I talked to him about his beliefs and the more I met people that were Mormon, I was just really impressed by... Um, just how nice they were and how they actually lived, you know, what they were taught, they practiced what they preach in many ways. And so I decided that I would become Mormon. And I was 18. My family wasn't that upset when I became Mormon, but they were very upset when I decided to go on a mission because um, traditionally an Arab girl is not supposed to leave her family until she gets married. And so uh, the fact that I was going across the world to do this missionary work, uh, really upset my family and they actually threatened to disown me but then when I went and you know they were very they became supportive and my mom would send me packages and everything like that so it it turned out okay uh-huh you mentioned your favorite your things you dined on being teased about mm-hmm so they, they, so did everybody hear the question about being teased? He was saying, what did, he asked me what I was teased about when I was growing up. So part of it was having dark skin. Uh, by the way, I'm like 10 shades darker in the summer. So that was something that I got teased about, uh, even for my family members, because I was always darker than everybody else in my family for some reason. But, um, but yeah, so that was one. And then my curly hair, which is funny. Again, you can't tell now, but my hair is very curly. And uh, many people would tease me for that, which I don't get that. But um, also people tease me because, you know, I remember in second grade, a boy teased me because he thought I was half black. And to him, that was weird. And therefore, I should be teased for that. So I think a lot of people just tease me because they didn't know. They just didn't understand me. They didn't understand who I was um, or what my background was, so their first reaction would be to tease me. Uh, also, I was teased for, um, well, I, you know, I was called things like camel jockey. Um, I was, you know, I was, again, called terrorist, all sorts of things. So just basically for being different. I was just teased for being different, eating different foods. Like I said, having parents that had accents and spoke a funny language. So things that now to me seem silly, and I can't believe that I, you know, got so upset. But when I was a kid, that, that was really hard to hear. Uh huh. You mentioned that you're, you went to bring him to bring Eric. Yeah. Yet you grew up in a Palestinian family. And right. Your parents obviously spoke their native tongue, so they never encouraged you and your siblings to learn. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So my parents uh, spoke to us in Arabic, but we responded in English. And they never really, yeah, they never really encouraged us because they thought that that would, um, 
if we spoke Arabic, maybe that would hinder our ability to speak English in school, and maybe that would cause problems for us. So they encouraged us to speak English. English. So I grew up understanding Arabic very well. And I could say basic phrases like, I'm hungry, or can we please leave this aunt's house? We've been here for three hours. But other than that, I really didn't know, I really didn't know how to speak much. So when I was at BYU, um, we learned Egyptian Arabic, which is kind of different than Palestinian Arabic. So that was kind of an adjustment for me. But, but it was really cool. Now I have two dialects under my belt, which I still don't speak, you know, I don't speak Arabic as fluently as I should because I don't practice it as often as I should. But the fact that um, I can carry on a conversation whereas I couldn't before is, is very good. Uh-huh. Are the youth oh. more today? Say that again. Are the youth, Are the youth more accepted? Well, I'm the youth, oh, you're talking about, oh, Arab American youth. Oh, okay, so her question is, are Arab American youth more accepted today? I think um, it really depends. So we, at the museum, we have a very unique opportunity to give tours to school groups from all over, not just Michigan, by the way, but from all over um, the United States, mostly the Midwest. And one thing we see is that there are some school groups that come in and they're very well versed in Arab culture and you teach them things and, and they teach us things. You know, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. And then there are other groups that come, in, in, come into the museum and they don't know anything about Arab culture whatsoever. And so, so the answer to your question is it depends on what kind of school these kids are going to. So if you're an Arab American child and you're going to a school where the kids don't know anything about Arab culture, they probably will tease you a little bit more, whereas if you go to one where they're more accepting or more, more diverse, usually the more diverse schools are the ones that where you know, the kids are a little bit more accepting and won't tease as much. So, um, but one thing that is really good that I've noticed is that, like I remember when I was in my early 20s, I was asked to go to the Plymouth Canton School District and speak at a diversity day. We didn't have diversity days when I was growing up. So, you know, I feel like a lot of these school districts are recognizing, okay, these areas are becoming more diverse. We need to make sure that we educate, you know, these kids about, about various cultures and religions. So, uh-huh. Uh, this area, Troy and Sterling Heights, has a large Chaldean population. Mm-hmm. Could you explain where the Chaldean came sure. Yes, definitely. So Chaldeans are from the northern villages of Iraq, and they're Christian, they're Catholic, and they are native to that area. So they were living there before the spread of the Arab Islamic Empire. So when the Arabs came in, the Chaldeans held on to their religion, held on to their language, but because they were living around so many Arabs, many of them adopted the Arabic language, and so that's why most Chaldeans that you meet will speak Arabic as well as Chaldean. And um, in terms of identity, it depends on the Chaldean. Ma most Chaldeans that I've met do not identify with being Arab because they were there, again, before the Arabs. But then there are some that do identify because Iraq is an Arab country, so they, they, still, you know, they still feel that they're tied to the Arab heritage. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like the best is that you walk into an area and it's like a little big thing that you've walked into. Uh, there are photos along the wall that make you feel as though you're in somebody's kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then you press a button and, and they start speaking about how you're cooking this or somebody's coming over and how they're preparing the food mm -hmm. uh, for that. Uh, and you go into another room and, and you're as Right. And it gives you so much of a feel for what exactly um, it was like to be, uh, not thrown in, but you're being mm -hmm. placed into uh, the situation at home. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's very well done. Thank you. Yeah, that's one thing that I love about our museum is that it's a narrative-based museum, so it's not... Sometimes people come and they, they expect to see mummies and who knows what else. But first of all, we focus, again, on Arab Americans, and it's 
narrative based, which means there are a lot of stories contained on the wall. So it is very interactive, and there are buttons to push. And in and, and the kitchen that um, this woman mentioned is, you know, you can, it's basically an exhibit that's modeled after a kitchen, and there, you can open up the cabinets and the refrigerator to see what an Arab American might have in their home. So it, it's really, it is really well done and, um, and very engaging. So one thing um, that uh, I would like to talk about a little bit is hospitality. Hospitality is a huge part of Arab culture. Has anybody here ever been into the home of an Arab at all? Okay, a few of you have. So were you offered food? Okay. Uh huh. And I love the cooking. Right? Do you? Oh yes. Me too. <laughs> yeah, and and food is a big part of our culture. I mean, food is a big part of everybody's culture, of course. But hospitality is very important, and it's it's extremely important to offer your guests uh, either food or you know either a meal or a snack or a coffee or tea. So. Um, by the way, being a Mormon, coffee is something that we're not supposed to drink. So imagine when I was living in Egypt, how difficult that was for me to explain. I don't drink coffee. So yeah, that was very hard. Also, Arabs are very persistent. So you say you don't drink coffee, and they say, that's OK, and they'll give it to you anyway. So you know, you have to learn ways to navigate around that. But it is, um, it is one of my favorite aspects of the culture, this hospitality, because it, I mean, I, again, just to give you an example, my very first day in Egypt, we, we lived in Alexandria. Um, well, the first time I lived in Egypt, I lived in Alexandria. And I was there with my non-Arab BYU friends, and we're on the beach, and we were t speaking in English. And this little Arab Muslim family, they were right next to us, and they heard us speaking in English, and they were fascinated. And then they heard us, we started speaking in Arabic a little bit, and they were really fascinated by that. So they started speaking to us in Arabic, and they asked us why we were in Egypt, and we explained. And then within 10 minutes, they invited us over to their home for dinner. They didn't know us at all. We could have been crazies for all they knew, but they, you know, again, it's just part of the culture. Another uh, story is that when I was growing up in Canton, uh, again, predominantly white neighborhood, the family across the street um, had a little girl that was my age, and she invited me over to play Barbies. So I, I went over to her house for a few hours, played with Barbies. I got home, and guess what the first question was that my parents asked? It wasn't, did you have fun, or what did you do? Yeah, did they offer you anything? Did you eat anything? And so when I told them that I wasn't offered anything, they were really offended because regardless of your age, you should be offered at least something, a glass of water, a glass of juice, some sort of snack. So um, yeah, so that just, again, gives you an idea of how important this concept of hospitality is in our culture. Other questions or comments about anything? Oh, yes. So I forgot to put this up here. This is my family. This was uh, a few years ago. Um, this is one of the last family pictures that were taken before my dad passed away, so that's why I put this one up here. But this is my brother, George. We're all doing silly faces, by the way. <laughs> we're a very goofy family. This is my brother, George, my brother, Sam, my dad and my mom, my sister, Sandy, me and my nephews, which are my sister's sons, George and Rick. Another George, right? <laughs> so George and George. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my family. Other questions, comments? You know, I watch, I watch my, you're, I know, right? I watch my big fat Greek wedding, and I was like, this is my family, <laughs> even though they're Greek. But honestly, so you know, I don't know, how many of you have seen that movie? Okay, a lot of you have. So you know, there's the, the vegetarian fiancé. And the aunt is saying, oh, that's okay, I'll make you lamb. Like, she doesn't, she can't grasp this concept of being vegetarian. Well, I was vegan for two years, so I didn't eat any, any animal products. So imagine the reactions I would get from my Arab family members. I would say, what do you mean? Well, we'll make you eggs, or we'll make you chicken. And I'm like, no, I'm vegan. I don't eat any of that. So that's why when I watched that movie, I just, I cracked up, because it was very, very similar. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming this evening. And please come to the museum. I left some literature on the back table for different events that we have coming up and also my cards. So if you ever have any questions for me, you can call me or email me. Thank you.